Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, my name is Xin Yang. I am a assistant research scientist at the high performance research computing. I also serve as the manager for the laboratory for molecular simulation, which is a um, university core facility that um, under the HPRC. Um, we provide support to uh, researchers on campus um, for molecular modeling, both um, the software aspect and the hardware aspect. Um, and Today we're talking about drug docking with molecular um, drug docking with Schrodinger, um, and here's the um, outline. So we will be introducing some basic concepts in um, like molecular modeling and how molecular modeling accelerates the drug discovery process. Um, we will also um, provide you a general understanding of the structure-based virtual screening, like how docking works. Um, and the best part about um, this short course is that uh, we have those hands-on sessions so that you will be able to use um, a piece of software called Schrodinger, um, um, like the drug, Schrodinger Drug Discovery Platform. Um, it is a renowned piece of software that is widely used in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, it is very expensive and even for academic license, uh, we pay tons of money for the license each year. And um, so today you will be able to use it for uh, free um, just for today. If you want to continue to use that for your research in the future, um, you can access this um, through um, the LMS subscription uh, with a much lower fee to um, that can access for um, this piece of software and a bunch of other um, uh, licensed software that's for uh, molecular modeling and uh, material science. All right, so as you may already know that the drug discovery process is extremely time consuming and costly. So the, um, this um, diagram shows you a pipeline of the drug discovery process that can be um, roughly broken into four uh, phase. Um, the first phase is the R&D phase, um, and then it's the preclinical trial, uh, the clinical trials, and then um, launch to like um, uh, submit um, to the FDA or other authorities for approval and launch to the market. Um, the first part, like the R&D part, takes um, like about six and a half years in general. And um, the success rate for each of the substance are listed at the first line um, in this diagram. So the R&D uh, phase includes several um, substance like the target validation, um, the target to hit, um, aka hit identification, um, hit to lead, and lead optimization. Mm. And um, what we will be focusing on is the hate identification. It's like um, the, um, the um, target to hate, and um, um, it's this step. Um, so um, there are like um, a astronic. Um, astronomical number of small molecules um, that can be drug-like. Um, and it's very difficult to find one that um, satisfies all the properties that a drug needs. So one way to um, increase the um, efficiency to find or um, increase the probability to find a drug-like molecule is to explore larger um, chemical space um, with um, more like chemical diversity. And um, studies shows that at screen index expand, um, there's a higher chance that you could find tight vendors. So then how do you find those drug-like molecules through a systematic method. Um, here are the methodologies for the hate identification. So um, hate um, refers to a small molecule that is known to bind to a target in drug discovery. Um, it, for like other drug-like 
properties like the metabolism, bioavailability, um, like um, toxicity, um, that's not um, going to be considered at the heat um, identification stage. Um, it's uh, we only um, focus on if it's going to bind to the target or not. So um, the <laughs> the high uh, throughput screening is a relative um, like um, innovation in the hate identification um, in the like um, recent years. Um, it allows a researcher to do like millions of tests a day, but it requires um, like special setup and it is very expensive. So uh, not very many universities can afford the high throughput screening. And the um, virtual screening um, use computer technologies to screen uh, libraries of small molecules. There are um, structure-based drug design and the ligand-based um, drug design. For structure-based drug design, um, you need to know the 3D structure of your target, uh, like the protein, um, and then through molecular docking um, or other types of simulation, um, you get more information about the ligand protein interaction. So that's gonna help you find um, um, a hit or a drug-like molecule. For ligand-based drug design, um, it's built on top of the um, QSAR, the quantitative structure activity relationship. And nowadays um, the AI ML is playing a um, more important role uh, in this route. All right, um, just, uh, yeah, we just mentioned that there are structure-based drug design and ligand-based drug design. Um, for structure-based drug design, um, the information that we need are the structure of the target, like the 3D structure of the protein. And we also need to know uh, the binding site, like where the binding site is. Um, it's um, like the, um, the, the purple um, space. Um, showing in the picture, like where the binding site is, like what's the shape of the binding site and other properties of the binding site. And ideally, um, this, um, if the target structure has a bound ligands inside, um, then um, that would be better because at least we know um, one ligand that binds to the structure and we know what the um, binding site and the shape of the binding site looks like. So um, that's the information we need for a structure-based drug design. For ligand-based drug design, less information is needed. Um, like uh, we need to know at least one hit uh, like that binds to the target. And ideally, um, if we can know the active conformation of that hit, because um, the um, bonds, they can rotate um, and the rings like in the um, molecule, um, they can flip. Uh, like um, the ligand itself is flexible. So um, the active uh, conformation would provide us more information about um, what the ligand looks like when it binds in the, um, um, when it binds to the target. So, um, yep, so um, just um, in general, like the ligand-based drug design uh, requires less um, information than the structure-based drug design. But uh, we will be focusing on the structure-based uh, drug design um, for today's purpose. To perform a structure-based drug design, uh, we need to know the structure of the target, um, like protein. So the mm, best source of um, the structure information would be the crystal structure, because um, like for crystal structure, um, you have a protein crystal and shoot the crystal with a beam of X-ray. And um, based on the uh, diffraction pattern, um, you um, get a electron density map. And with the information of the sequence of the protein, you would try to map the sequence to, the, um, like, um, to a structure that would reproduce um, the electron density map. Um, but uh, in a lot of time, you don't get a um, pro you don't get a crystal because protein crystal um, is hard is hard like um, there are 
millions of reasons that um, a protein cannot um, be crystallized. And even if you have a crystal structure, because um, um, due to the limitation of the resolution, a lot of information um, is missing in the crystal structure. Um, so, um, yeah. And in addition to crystal structure, um, other um, sources of um, protein structure can be obtained from like um, an MR spectroscopy um, for um, and like homology modeling. Um, yeah, mm, a quick comment about the homology modeling. Uh, we um, like if you have heard of the um, like alpha fold two and res um, reseta fold. Uh, we have already have those two pieces of software installed on the HPRC cluster. So feel free to um, to try. It. Um, yeah, and um, recent years, um, like um, structure information from cryo EM um, are also um, like become uh, more and more available. All right, um, now it's the time for the first um, hands-on um, session. So in this hands-on session. Um, you will be running Mastro in a VNC session through the portal. And um, you will also be learning um, some of the basic operations of um, using Mastro, like creating projects and importing um, structures. Um, the um, tutorial um, are available um, at the Scratch training guide document on Grace. So for the hands-on part, I will show you a demo and then um, you can just um, um, try it yourself. Uh, right now I'm already on um, Grace portal um, to download the uh, tutorials. Um, you can uh, use the files tab and um, click go to and go to the training. Sorry, all my typo. Uh, training and um, glide docking. Um, and yeah, we have a few um, video clips for each of the hands-on part and the tutorial for the hands-on part, like with uh, both pictures and um, text um, is available um, as the grid stalking tutorial um, that you can highlight um, the one that you need and click download. It will download to your um, local machine. Um, I think I saw, oh, uh, thanks Chris for uh, putting the link. Yep, and um, you can go back uh, once you have downloaded the tutorial, you can go back to the interactive session. Uh, we are going to need a B and C session for um, like to use Schrodinger. You can choose um, three hours, four cores, uh, eight gigabytes of memory, and click launch. When the resource is available, um, um, you can uh, launch a uh, VNC session. And just to um, save, like for the sake of time, um, I have a uh, pre recorded video clip showing you how to. Um, log in to the portal and launch um, Mastro. It may take a few minutes for the resource to get ready. Um, depends on um, if the machine is busy or not. Um, once you launch a BNC session, um, you wanna load the Schrodinger module. The latest version we have on Grace is 2021-3. Uh, and you just type Mastro um, to launch the uh, Mastro graphical interface. 
the Spectra is a really um, large software. It may take over than a minute um, for the graphical interface um, to show up here. Um, and if like the menu bar is missing on the uh, master interface, you might want to right click the gray part um, and click to restart the black box. Um, then like um, the menu bar uh, will appear. And then you want to change the uh, working directory to your scratch directory. Um, that means uh, scratch uh, user your net ID and create a new folder called master. Then all your files would be um, put into that directory. And to import a, oh, um, and you also want to save your project um, in the working directory just by giving it a file name. To import, uh, okay, so uh, in the workspace, um, there's a menu um, that you can customize mouse interaction, uh, sorry, mouse uh, actions so that you can drag or rotate your molecules. Um, if, you, if you're using a free button mouse, then you can uh, choose to um, customize that um, by free button mouse. Um, and to import um, structures, I have a PDB file uh, prepared for you in the um, Scratch training um, glide docking directory. Um, if you have a structure of your own, you can put it uh, like in your uh, scratch directory, it would, but um, like import the structure would be using the same way as it shown here. Yep, and that's it. Then we are going to move to the next step. Um, so in the first hands on session, uh, we import the PDB structure into the um, Maestro. Mm. A PDB structure is not suitable for immediate, uh, immediate use for docking um, because a PDB file typically contains uh, like the information about heavy atoms, co-crystallized ligand, water molecules, metal ions, cofactors. There are a lot of information that's not necessary for um, the docking purpose. So we want to uh, clean up the information in the PDB file. Um, and very often, the PDB file, um, like the structure in the PDB file um, is multimeric. Like there are, um, um, like the protein is a uh, multimer um, and it needs to be reduced to a single unit. And because of the limited um, resolution, um, it's difficult to um, distinguish the carbon and nitrogen atoms um, in the um, carbonyl or um, amide groups. Um, and PDB file may also um, have incorrect information about bound orders, um, charge state, and orientation of the groups. So we need to prepare the protein, like pre-process the protein before we use it for docking. Um, on the right side, um, it shows a um, like the um, PDB structure colored by uh, like using a VMD to color it. Like the gray only the it's not able to say very clearly, but um, the gray part and the orange part, um, like they are the like regular um, thing, but the red part and the green part. Um, um, all needs human effort, at least at some level, because um, uh, the red part indicates um, it, it has missing atoms and uh, the green part um, indicate that um, that residue has alternate conformation. And it all needs, and this problem needs to be fixed uh, before using the structure for docking. Um, uh, in addition to the issues we just mentioned, um, there might be missing atoms um, in the structure file or missing segments. So missing atoms are relatively easy to fix. 
um, a lot of the times uh, hydrogens are not included in the PDB file because uh, the crystal structure, they get the information from X-ray crystallography. Um, it, uh, hydrogens are not e able to be resolved. And um, for some side chains that are very flexible, um, that part of the information um, is also missing. Um, so in, uh, you need to uh, fill in the uh, missing chains. And there are a lot of utilities that can be used to fill in the missing atoms or side chains. Um, if your structure has it fret, uh, has segments missing, then that's more complicated to fix. Uh, nowadays, um, people typically use homology modeling to obtain reasonable results um, if like more than a few residues are missing. Um, like the picture on the right um, shows like the, if it's just missing a single residue, um, that's relatively easy to fix. And if just a few um, atoms, especially hydrogens, um, they're very easy to be fixed as well. Um, so the protein preparation also um, includes to sampling the protonation states. Because for aspartic acid and glutamic acid, at physiological pH, they are negatively charged. Um, but crystal um, structure um, doesn't have the information about the proton, uh, the protonation states. So that um, also needs to be fixed. Uh, for histidine, in addition to the three different protonation states, it also has the tautomeric states because uh, the um, nitrogen and carbon in the emit diesel ring, they, um, it can be switched because the um, that's due to the um, like limited resolution of the um, X-ray crystallography. Like they can't um, resolve um, carbon and nitrogen in the amidizer ring um, properly. So that you also get um, different tautomeric states, um, and that um, that's also something um, that needs to be pre-processed before doing the docking. So in um, Schrodinger, um, we use um, protein preparation workflow um, to um, prepare protein and resolve the problem that we just pointed out. Um, the protein preparation workflow is sort of a new feature from the 2021 release. Um, in the past, um, we use uh, protein preparation wizard. A lot of the functions are um, like our overlap, but um, yeah, this is to show you what the uh, protein preparation workflow panel looks like. Um, so by um, toggling on and off the interactive button, um, you can choose um, to like run over these processes either interactively. Uh, that means step by step, you just clip, click um, pre-process or um, these um, like um, to run over these. Um, procedures one by one, or you can um, use a uh, like non-interactive mode. That means like as a batch job. So that um, like after um, setting all this up, um, it runs as a single job. Um, in the um, preparation workflow tab, um, like you can um, specify which protein um, you wanna use. Or um, like it, it can be from the local files, uh, like the PDB structure that I provided you, or you can get PDB structure from the RCSB website by entering the PDB ID. Um, like, um, and once you import the um, structure, uh, you can um, use the review structure link to go to the um, like substructure tab, which we will be talking about uh, later. Um, and for the uh, global settings, um, you can set uh, the pH for the simulation. Um, and um, you can decide if you wanna include the uh, ligands, um, metal and ions, or other uh, like uh, non-water 
solvents into the process or not. Uh, the next like, step is the pre-process step. So the pre-process step uh, fix structure defects and necessary information. So that's um, the um, step where you can um, fix the bond orders um, and um, replace hydrogens. That means to like delete all the hydrogens that um, have already exist and re like add hydrogens um, to satisfy the um, the the octet like to um, um, you can also choose to uh, create zero bond orders to metals or um, to include disulfide bond. Mm -hmm. And there are a few, um, a bunch of other um, settings. Um, for here, if you have uh, missing atoms or missing um, residues, um, the like, Schrodinger platform has another piece of software called Prime. Um, so it can be used to filling in uh, missing loops because uh, uh, for the loops that are solvent exposure, it can be very flexible. So um, when it um, it could not be easily resolved from the crystal structure, um, and um, like um, during the pre-process step, um, um, like that's the utility that you can use to um, fill in the missing chains, um, and um, it also uh, generates the ionization and tautomeric states for um, hit groups and you can choose uh, the pH or um, the, like you can choose the like, um, yeah, pH to generate um, that um, states. And the next um, procedure is the um, optimized hydrogen bond assignment step. So in your um, protein structure, there are a lot of co-crystallized um, water molecules and they form um, hydrogen bond network. Um, you want to optimize the hydrogen bond network by changing the orientation of the water molecules or the like, charged group so that um, the charge-charge interaction and hydrogen bonding could be um, improved so that make it more stable. So, um, this can be achieved by reorienting the hydrogen, um, hydroxyl or thiol groups or like flip the terminal amide groups and histidine rings. Um, and it also um, predicts the protonation states of those um, residues um, so that um, it could um, like, mm, um, assign the correct protonation states to it to um, like increase um, this uh, interaction. Um, and in this step, you can also choose to sample water orientation or not. Um, to um, sample the water orientation is to ensure the water molecules, they are optimally uh, placed so that um, you get um, hydrogen bonding. Because um, for hydrogen bonding, they, um, it um, has a restriction on the like oxygen, hydrogen, oxygen, um, angle. If the angle is too small, then you won't get um, hydrogen body. So um, like that's what the um, optimize hydrogen bond assignment step um, mainly does. Um, it's to reorient the water molecules to increase the hydrogen body uh, network for the system. <laughs> All right, the next step to, oh, um, this is still the uh, hydrogen bond assignment step. Um, like you can choose to use crystal symmetry or um, to um, just uh, minimize hydrogens of altered species. The uh, first option is useful when um, part of the structure is present in an asymmetric unit. Um, and um, when you choose to do the optimization, you can choose um, like um, to use um, 
like a pH, um, like include to consider pH uh, based on different groups. One is to use the pro pKa, um, which contains uh, atom level information, um, and it could uh, be also used uh, like you can also just use simple rules uh, for pH. Um, like it's like um, it doesn't consider the local environment of that specific residue. Um, it will be based all on the physiological pH for the entire uh, structure, but like it won't consider the local environment for the specific residues. Um, Um, and the last step is the cleanup step. So in this step, um, you uh, perform a restraint minimization on the structure and delete um, water molecules that's not necessary. Um, well, by default, all atoms are minimized. Um, if you choose, uh, they converge heavy atoms uh, to like RMSD, or you can choose to optimize hydrogens only. Um, this would allow some movement of the heavy atoms, like the, the backbones, and uh, we will uh, we'll result in some deviation from the input structure. Um, and um, the fourth field that you can use to do the minimization um, is um, the OPLS4. That's the latest force field that Schrodinger has. Um, it, um, they claimed um, there's a significant improvement for charged groups and sulfur content moieties. Um, um, and you also have the option to delay to water molecules. Because for um, docking, a lot of the time you don't want to delay water molecules that close to the binding site. Because the water, the crystal, um, like the water molecules, um, the structure, of water, uh, the structure of water molecules, it helps to maintain the shape of the binding site. So if you took the structure, uh, the structure of water molecule out, it may, like the binding site may shrink um, so that um, you might not find the, the, the heat molecule that you want to have. Um, so um, like whether or not to delete water molecules, um, that um, depends that totally depends on your research need. Um, the substructure tab, that's what you get from the um, like first step by reviewing the, the structure. Um, you get a like three tables in this um, um, tab. They it will list the um, head groups. So head groups are um, everything that's not uh, a water or the uh, protein molecule. So um, most of the time it's the non-water solvent molecules or um, cofactors or like uh, metal ions. Um, um, and um, here you get a table of the water molecules and the uh, chains. So for this example, uh, there are two chains. It's like if, um, your, if your structure um, has like it's multimers, um, you only want to use one unit for docking. So you can like delete um, like a whole chain by using um, this substructure uh, tab. Mm, yeah, and um, the purpose of this tab is to uh, make it easier for you to delete um, components that you don't need. Uh, in the substructure, um, if you've already done the um, pre-process step, um, you will be able to choose the um, protonation states um, of the uh, like um, of a residue. Um, so here, um, like it because it um, the program runs the epic job at the target pH and generate um, different possible uh, protonation states of the residue. 
and it will show uh, the state penalty for each of um, these states. Um, and you need to like choose um, the one that uh, best fits your um, like your need. Um, and once you finish all the preparation and um, checking the diagnostic tab, um, you shouldn't see like any um, issues um, like in the diagnostic tab. Um, so there are a few sub tabs here, like um, um, the balance usually indicates that the like, um, bond orders are not set up uh, correctly. That could um, be usually can be easily fixed after you're doing the minimization step. Um, if there's like missing um, residues or like missing segments, um, that will also show up here. So this is like a sanity check uh, before you move to the next step. Yeah, um, that's pretty much um, what we like, how we prepare the protein and how we use the protein preparation workflow to prepare uh, the protein. So um, any questions for now? Um, if not, we can move to the next hands-on session. Um, in this section, um, you get to prepare uh, the one FGS, which you just imported uh, from a PDB file using the protein preparation workflow. Um, so you get to uh, fix the uh, missing atoms or um, optimize the hydrogen bond network and minimize the structure um, by using um, yeah, the protein preparation workflow. Um, I also have a little demo for this. So we've already um, imported the structure into the workspace. Um, so we'll just use the local files. And um, since it has um, different um, units, we want to only keep the um, chain A. Um, and for this one, um, all the head groups, I mean, um, the non water solvent are not important for the docking, so we can delete all of them. In the pre-process step, um, I think I just keep the default settings. Um, and in the cleanup, I chose um, the latest force field. And I choose to run the job as a batch job. Um, so I'll just give it a job name and click run. You can also choose to do this interactively so that you can see the result from each step and um, make um, modifications uh, more precisely. Um, and then your structure is uh, prepared you will see that um, there are a few indications there showing that flip. Um, that means it uh, like flipped the um, residue, most likely the, um, like it reoriented the side chains.
so whether or not to dilate the water molecules or the non-water solvent, um, that depends on your um, knowledge about our understanding of the protein um, itself. And, um, and that's like um, case by case. Um, let me know if you need help or if you have any questions. Um, it doesn't have to be closely related to um, uh, to the tutorial. And before moving to the next step, you want to check the diagnostic and make sure um, you don't have any remaining issues before moving to the next step.
Do you need me to wait for it? Oh, okay. You've already you've already got it. Okay, cool. Um, then, any questions? No. <laughs> um, do you know what force field is? The OPL S four. Do you know what like what it does? Oh, how do you call? Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, yes, the, the, the like the potential. Um yeah, it defines the kind of defines the potential energy. Um yeah. Yep. All right. Um then we can move on to the next step. Hmm. Um, oops, sorry. Um, Maxim holds Chrome going back to hey. Um, once we get uh, the protein structure prepared, uh, the next step is to prepare a ligand. Um, for ligand, um, it can be either 2D or 3D structures, uh, but uh, once it's prepared, um, like we, we need to get um, those um, like uh, ligand to be low energy 3D structures. And um, by ligand preparation, it also generates reasonable atomic coordinates for uh, the ligand data set uh, and give um, um, and like, make predictions on the tautomeric states, ionization states, uh, ring conformations, um, stereo, um, stereo isomers and conformers um, like after the preparation um, by considering uh, pH and local environment. So um, just as um, what I showed you for the um, histidine or the residue, like part of the uh, protein structure, uh, the ligand can also have uh, like different uh, protonation states or tautomeric states. Um, and it needs to be sampled uh, before the docking. Um, to prepare a uh, ligand, uh, we can use the lake prep. Um, the first step is of course to import structures. Um, it can, like you can import structures from your uh, project. Um, it can be um, in the um, SD format or SMILES format. There are um, ligand data sets that's um, publicly available or like uh, from like, or like commercial um, ligand data sets. Um, and um, you can choose to filter the ligand in a ligand data sets based on um, certain properties, for example, um, like you can only choose to use ligands that are below a certain molecular weight um, or um, less than a certain number of atoms, um, or only use ligand um, that has certain functional groups. Um, you can choose um, like force field to um, do the minimization for the ligand as well so that it could generate the most stable conformation. Um, and, um, to predict the ionization states, uh, there are the ionizer and the epic. Um, the epic one is the recommended one. Um, and you can choose to um, desalt. Um, the, um, that is to remove extra water molecule or counter ions um, that's present in the ligand um, files. Um, and um, you can also choose to uh, generate tolerance. Um, like, um, Keto NO isomerization, um, sulfur nitrogen, or um, like histidine, um, flips the amide isoring, and um, the DNA base tautomerization. For lake prep, um, it takes about one to two seconds on average to process the ligand. Um, and, excuse me. Um, and, and after the lake prep, 
um, the results will uh, be shown um, like in epic state penalty. Like uh, you can see the um, energy um, difference of um, like different confirmation of protonation states of the ligand. All right. Um, the third hands-up part is to do the ligand preparation um, and examine uh, protein um, ligand interactions. Um, I'll play my little demo in a second. Mm. Oops. Go back. No. There we go. Yeah, um, please let me know when you are done with it. Um, this is from an old clip, but um, it should be similar. Um, like you need to um, split your prepared structure into um, like ligand and um, protein. Because um, we already delayed all the water molecules uh, from the like, protein preparation. And then only um, include uh, ligand. You can choose to use the latest force field um, the OPL S3E is the um, like the uh, one version of the four, and we just keep the like, default settings. And then um, you will see a number of tautomers incorporated into the project. by include um, the structure into the workspace, you can uh, check and compare the difference. And by clicking the gear on top of the entry list um, and search for state penalty, um, you would be able to see, to find like the most stable uh, automatic states uh, among these, among the label. Um, let me know if you have any questions or if you were able to um, achieve this.
Like it's different, like the like you can open the one slide and there's no difference. But um, sometimes people have to like think of that or the way it's done. So, Lokensha, are you trying to follow? Um, do you have any questions? Um, feel free to put um, in the chat. So, um, what we had done are just um, preparations for docking. Um, like we did um, ligand preparation, we did protein preparation. Um, and here's like, um, like the steps for um, um, structure-based virtual screening. Um, so docking is to um, place different 
confirmations of the uh, ligand into the binding site. Um, and we call that um, poses. Um, and we wanna see if uh, like the ligand would fit into the uh, binding site um, or not. Um, for docking, there are rigid receptor docking. There are um, uh, uh, like induced fit docking and there are covalent docking. Uh, the most typical um, way of docking is like the, uh, like we keep the receptor, which means the protein, the target is rigid on the binding site. It's fixed. The binding site does not move during the docking process. Um, and then your only the ligand is flexible. It's that the ligand can change conformations. Um, and after the docking, we use scoring functions to evaluate um, the um, like the different poses, um, so that we know uh, which uh, ligands they can bind to the binding site more strongly than others. Then we can like um, just um, give up on the ones that doesn't. Um, um, like make a good fit to the binding site. Um, and um, to evaluate the um, poses, there are um, like docking scores, uh, like G-glide uh, glide scores and uh, E-model, like different ways of evaluating um, the uh, poses. Mm. Um, and um, like during the like first part of the docking step, um, you typically want to start with the cognate ligand. That means the bond lig uh, the ligand that bonds to the uh, target in the crystal structure. Um, so to just to get an idea of your setup of the docking procedure. And once you're uh, like confident with that, you can try to refine your uh, your like setup for the docking model to see if like the docking grid, um, if it's appropriate or not. And then um, to improve uh, the model and then to screen more uh, ligands. Will be, um, yep, so um, the docking that we typically refer to um, is a rigid receptor docking. Um, that means we search the best scoring binding codes for a given, for a given ligand. Um, the um, receptor itself is um, rigid. Um, and in Schrodinger, um, that's the uh, like can be achieved through um, glide HTVS, um, single precision, the SP and extra precision. Um, receptor is rigid um, and ligand is flexible. Um, so you have prepared ligand with ligand sampling, you get a collection of ligand confirmations and you try to place the ligand into the binding site. And the binding site itself is rigid, but in reality, the protein is moving all the time. Uh, the like the the binding site is always um, flexible. Um, so yeah, that's the um, like limitations of um, this kind of simulations. Hmm. To do ligand docking on Schrodinger, we use the ligand docking panel. Um, you need to choose a receptor grid. The receptor grid is like where you want to put your uh, ligand. It's like the binding site. And then um, you need prepared ligand. It can be from local files or it can be from um, databases. Um, then in the um, settings, um, if you look at the first line, the precision, um, you can choose um, like um, HTVS or single precision or um, extra precision. Uh, we can talk, um, I have a slide for that later. Um, and then um, you can choose different options for um, ligand sampling um, and for scoring. And um, in the constraints tab, um, you can set some restrictions for the docking. Uh, for example, um, you, um, always want the ligand to have certain interaction with the binding site. Um, like you, um, 
you can say like, I always want to have a hydrogen bond between the ligand and the binding site. Um, if um, the ligand doesn't have a hydrogen bond with the um, binding site, then um, I'll just filter it out. Like um, you can set up those cons um, constraints uh, in the docking. Um, and the um, output, um, in the output tab, you can set the file format for the output. It can be either a master or SD. Um, and um, you can choose to do um, post docking minimization or per residue interaction. Um, for the, mm, so how do you find binding site? Um, if you have a uh, crystal structure that has a bound ligand, then that's relatively uh, easy. Um, if you don't have that, uh, like the Schrodinger has uh, the site map um, utility that's gonna um, help you predict where the binding site is. Um, once you know where the binding site is, you need to um, generate a grid. So the grid defines where your ligand will be put um, during the docking process. Um, so um, like if um, the box that you give it is too small, then um, the ligand won't fit, it won't dock. Um, you have a good chance of missing good ligand. Um, if the box that you set is too big, then uh, the ligand can um, have a lot of options to put into the protein. Then um, it increases the computational cost. And since uh, like the space you give it is too flexible, then you have a good chance of missing good binding sets. So you want have a grid, you want to set up a um, like the, the box um, to have a good size. So here on the right, um, the green box here um, like defines where the center of the ligand can be. And then there's a larger um, box that's in purple color. Um, it won't show like um, you would only see like these two lines. There's a larger purple box out there, and that defines um, like all the atoms of the ligand must be within um, this um, space. Um, and since we're doing rigid receptor docking, the um, binding pocket is not flexible. Um, it's, it, it's, it's there. Um, it doesn't move. Um, if you want to um, give the binding site some flexibility, then um, um, you might want to use molecular dynamics simulation to um, investigate the stability of the binding site. Uh, for docking, we are like um, only the, the ligand is flexible. All right, so um, this session, um, you're going to generate a receptor grid. Let me find out a um, demo for grid generation. Oh, uh, I think in, um, in this demo, I um, copied the grid from um, the tutorial that Schrodinger provided. Um, um, Yeah. Sorry, this is a little bit messy here. Um, well, I think you can start from here. Um, choose um, receptor grid generation.
and make sure you include the prepared structure. Um, we want to have a box um, that's 10, 8, 6 angstroms in height, width. Um, and then it asks you to pick a atom in the ligand. We also want to set some constraints for the uh, grid. We want to have a hydrogen bond. And you want to find the oxygen, um, the, click the two oxygens um, in residue 189. So come in.
um, we will take a break and resume at 3.15. All right, um, let's move on. Um, when stocking is performed, you want to evaluate uh, the different poses using different scoring functions. Um, a scoring function very roughly approximates the binding affinity of a ligand to a protein um, given a binding pose. So on the um, diagram shown on the um, left side, you will see that um, if like, your ligand fits well with the receptor, um, um, like you get a uh, lower score um, if it doesn't bind to the receptor so well. Um, um, the um, score is not so negative. So in um, yeah um, in the scoring of um, using Schrodinger, um, the negative score um, the better. And uh, one thing that needs to be paid attention is that the um, score does not correlate, the docking score does not correlate with um, any properties like IC50 or KD or EC50 or etc. Um, like in Schrodinger, the more negative the score, um, the better. Um, the score is just a approximate, um, um, uh, it's just like roughly correlated to the binding affinity. Um, and um, what the, uh, the score is useful for you to separate good ligand from bad ligands um, and um, so that you don't have to um, investigate a whole bunch of ligands further. Um, it, it just helps you to uh, find the like, yeah, separate good ligands from the bad ones. Um, and um, um, there are the um, the extra precision and the uh, the SP the standard precision um, scoring functions. Um, the computing time for that are different. Um, for um, if you choose to use standard precision, it takes about five to twenty seconds per molecule, um, and it's typically used for the first path um, on a large database um, with um, extra precision. Um, it takes much longer, um, about three to five minutes for a single molecule. And it's typically used for refinement of a smaller data set um, for lead optimization. So the um, standard precision seeks to minimize false negatives, uh, while XP seeks to uh, minimize false positives. And um, the reason that the XP um, is more computational mm, demanding is because um, the scoring function also includes um, like more stringent terms um, like desolvation, um, hydrophobic effects, or charged interactions. Um, there's also something called E model. Um, this is primarily defined by protein ligand, coulomb mantle energy um, with a small contribution from uh, glide score. Um, and the E model score um, helps you to choose uh, the best docked structure from like, each ligand. It's not like um, different conformations or tautomeric states of a single ligand rather than help, um, help you to screen a large data set of ligand. Oh, <laughs> all right. Um, here comes the next hands-on part. Um, in this part, you're going to dock the cognate ligand and uh, viewing different binding poses. Um, 
you should be able to find a ligand docking um, using the search bar. Um, you can find the uh, receptor that you just generated um, in your like master direction. Um, that should be called uh, glide grid. Um, and the ligands you want to dock, you can either um, choose uh, from the uh, your preparation result or include the ligand um, from the workspace. And um, for the docking, um, you want to use the constraints that you just set for your, um, like when you generate the grade. So um, this slide shows the formulation of the um, glide docking SP. Uh, basically, um, that tells you how the G-score is calculated. Um, it includes um, Randall in interaction, um, the Coulomb energy, um, lipophilic term, like hydrophobic terms, um, the uh, hydrogen bonding terms, the um, metal binding term um they um a um a reward term um that's gained from penalties for various features such as varied polar groups hydrophobic enclosure uh, correlated hydrogen bonds they might twist and etc um it covers all terms other than those explicitly uh, mentioned terms. Um, um, and it also includes penalties for freezing rotatable bonds and um, polar but non hydrogen bonding atoms in a hydrophobic region um, are rewarded in this like, um, standard precision um, docking. Um, the extra precision, um, it include, um, it increases computational cost. Um, it does the XP 
um, and then adds the extra precision terms into the standard precision. Mm, it is better at locating regions where water molecules have unfavorable chemical potential um, and occupy these regions with suitable ligand groups that provide exceptional gains in potency with a relatively small number of atoms. Um, if your ligand has ring structures um, and um, you can like anchor some of the fragments um, so and the, to make the rest part um, um, it's like you can fix part of it and then only um, let other parts move um, and it also includes improvements to the scoring of hydrogen bonds um, as well as detection of buried polar groups and detection of pi cation and pi pi stacking interactions um because uh, they those non um yeah the hydrogen bonds are hard um yeah in um this kind of system mm. yeah um this is just a diagram show uh, showing you um the what does the xp result looks like like um you get all the results um that's uh, like in the red uh, box from the um, extra uh, precision um and yeah you get penalties like hydrogen bonding penalties um ex i don't know exposure um or like rotate penalties and all that stuff um that's not available if you only do a standard um precision um, docking and um once you um docked a um, like small library of ligands and um have a good feeling of um how you set up for the um docking um that means like um how do you like your uh the grade that you generated for the binding site uh, like how um like how many ligands that um you find have good binding affinity with the uh, target um it's like you have a training set first you have a library of known um hits and you put it in you put this hit um you mix it with a few like ligands that's not going to bind to the target and you use your um, docking model and try to um, screen the test set if like all the known hits can be screened from this model then you know that your model is good then you can use it for a larger phase set so that's kind of uh, the uh, the reason uh, behind this um, and uh, like once that is done um, you can either choose to refine your model like if it doesn't um, screen out all the known hits from your training set then uh, you might want to um, add more constraints to it so that um, for example if you have a lot of uh, uh, ligands that are not known to bind, but it didn't filter it out, then you might want to add more constraints to the model. Um, if like only a few number of the known hits have been screened out from your model, then you want to uh, relax the model, model, like remove all the constraints. Um, yeah, it's like, um, like once a small um, set of ligand has been done, um, you can um, refine your model. Um, and uh, with the compounds that you have screened out, um, you can um, like evaluate those ligands further uh, with more um, complicated um, or elaborate simulations, um, like molecular dynamics simulations. 
um, to find properties such as um, um, entropy or um, to like include to yeah, to include factors such as entropy and explicit solvation. Um, I don't know. Um, the next hands up part is to um, just to give you an idea of how to screen a larger set of ligand molecules um, and being able to um, take a look at the result from docking XP um, from a like a, um, a prepared like um, like a prepared result. I don't know how to. Um, so for uh, this one, um, there is a data set called Fifty Ligands. Um, epic, you can import this uh, ligand set um, from the, um, like it's available in the training uh, glide docking path. Since I've already imported um, this, Data set, I can just um, use, the use the structure from the workspace. Um, and in the and we will be using the same um, binding, like the same grid that generated um, for the previous. Okay. Um, once it's finished, you can use the pose viewer to examine different poses. And the project table. List different properties of the docking result. Um, you can choose to turn on and off the property by using the property tree on the right side. I guess here I only want to show the glide score. Only the primary glide score, and that's the docking score, the um, glide score, and the uh, since we don't have time to do a extra precision docking. Um, um, there's a, like, um, this is just the result from a extra uh, precision docking. Um, and you would be able to see that um, it includes more information um, than um, you have for a single, uh, sorry, a standard precision. Um, and yeah, once that is, down um, that you can close master by closing the window and then uh, log out. So um, master um, is a, like you will still be using uh, the uh, the Schrodinger for I think our license is good till today. So if you want to explore it after this, um, I think it would be still be good till the end of today. Yep. Um, I think I have a video clip that I didn't have a chance to show up. Uh, what, what, 
was that? Mm. Oh, I think that's how you like generate a surface for the finite set or even to realize the potential energy um, surface um, of the, uh, the electrostatic, sorry, the electrostatic back for the finite set. So there are a lot of um, presets for the styles of the molecules, like how you wanna, um, your, how you wanna show your molecules. Um, and on the right bottom side, you can choose to turn on the interactions. Um, it will detect um, those interactions mainly based on distance, I guess. And then you can choose to select a binding site um, and generate a service for the binding site. So that um, like this may help you um, have a better idea of what the binding site looks like. Um, you can add an electrostatic potential to the surface so that you would be able to see that which part has partial negative charge and which part has partial positive charge um, so that it might help you um, know how to reorient your ligand. And now it shows the um, Posing uh, ligand interaction. Um, it's called the ligand interaction diagram. Um, you can choose to sync with 3D. So when you rotate uh, in the workspace, it will uh, rotate, um, it will sync uh, with um, the, the, 2D, the 2D map will um, sync the uh, 3D. The structure in the third space. Um, and yep. Um, in the last few minutes, I'll um, quickly go over the covalent docking. Um, what we have been doing, uh, like, um, are all for like non-covalent docking. Um, that means um, there's no covalent bond between the ligand and the, uh, the target. Um, like the uh, ligand and the binding sites are only interacted by non-covalent interactions, but there are uh, nearly 30% of the marketed drugs targeting enzymes known to act by covalent interaction. Um, on the top right, there are a few examples of the like, covalent drugs. And um, the, um, like, in, um, the way that the covalent uh, drug that act with the um, binding site can be either reversible or irreversible. And um, covalent inhibitors um, derive their activity not only from the formation of a covalent bond between the target and the ligand, but also from stabilizing non-covalent forces in the binding pocket. In the binding pocket. Um, I think on the right, I just gave a example of covalent complex um, with the co-crystal ligand and another structure with the co-crystal uh, ligand. Um, and it's, yeah, I think, um, yeah, it uh, interacts with a um, target by a um, enemy bound. Um, I'm not so sure at this moment, um, but since like um, it forms covalent um, interaction, um, it 
like involves bond breaking and bond making. Um, so it's definitely more complicated uh, than just doing a non-covalent um, docking. So here's a kind of a diagram um, showing the procedures for doing the covalent docking. In Schrodinger, there are a lot of like, templates. Um, that's what they call custom covalent reactions. It's like those templates, if um, they, um, if your ligand happens to uh, fall into one of the uh, the template that they have, then you can do um, covalent um, docking. Um, the major steps for um, cold dock um, is like first you want to do a conventional non covalent docking using uh, GLAD for the preactive species, and then um, you map out the covalent um, attachment um, through the different kind of mechanisms I'm showing in the, uh, in the previous slide. And then um, you want to do structure refinement um, of the covalent complex using prime. They, um, what you can get from cove dog um, is the cove dog affinity, uh, prime energy and ligand um, reaction site. Um, cove dog is very, um, computational demanding. Um, the default protocol, like docks, um, one uh, like takes about two, one to two hours to dock a ligand. There's a virtual screening protocol that is about 10 times faster. Um, but like the uh, covalent docking, it's still very challenging uh, because it involves the electronic structure change. There's bond formation and bond cleavage, and that, um, yeah, and that could only be accurately described by quantum mechanical simulation. So, um, yeah, you still do not see a lot of uh, um, research on covalent docking. So to wrap up for today's lecture, um, we talked about how to do docking with Schrodinger. Um, to do that, um, we need a um, target, we need the compound library. We need to filter the library and use um, leg prep to prep the ligand library. And um, we also need a target like a protein that we want to um, uh, like dock the ligand to. Um, we need to prepare the protein to generate the braids. By that, uh, we need to know where the active site is. And we need to test the grids so that uh, the grid is not too big or too small um, so that we might miss uh, good um, hit molecules. And then uh, we do the virtual screening. Um, there's a lot of post-process after the virtual screening, uh, like um, you can further narrow down um, your uh, ligand libraries and then do uh, like uh, more uh, complicated simulations. Um, so yeah, we have a Schrodinger installed on the HPRC cluster. It is a restricted software, so um, um, it's only, um, well, it's restricted to subscribers of the LMS, um, but we have some information on the wiki page. Um, the LMS also hold license for um, like a bunch of other pieces of software for molecular modeling and uh, material science. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to um, contact us through email. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much all for today. Um, let me know if you have any questions.